I would like to call the Tuesday, November 26, 2019 Committee of the Whole to order. Uh, should we stand and recite the pledge? I think once is enough, Chairman, but whatever you wish. Uh, no, you're the, you're the uh, well, well, uh, all the veteran, so we'll go with your. Mr. Clerk, would you please take the roll? Will do. Alderman Redpath. Here. Alderman Gregory. Here. Alderwoman Turner. Here. Alderman Fulginzi. Here. Alderman Proctor. Here. Alderwoman DeCenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderwoman Connolly. Present. Alderman Donnellan. Here. Alderman Hanauer. Here. Mr. Chairman, a quorum is present. Thank you. Um, I would accept a motion for the approval of the November, November 12, 2019 Someone committee meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any against? Motion pass. Are there any presentations? Yes. Mr. Uh, Joe Zebert. Well, I, oh. I'm going to present. Oh, you're gonna, okay. he's, I'm going to present that he's going to present. How's that? Good evening. If you recall, about a year ago, I, I had a retail study done. And we received the information shortly after the first of the year um, on their findings. And a lot of it was a lot of data that we needed, data that was important to us for attracting businesses. And so we started trying to figure out how we could best disseminate this kind of information. So in one of our, like Molly and I meet probably about twice a month, in, in one of our meetings I was bemoaning the fact that I had been searching for some sort of application, some way to display this information, and that I didn't have the money for it. So she was kind enough to say, well, show me what you found, what is it, and I think my guys can probably replicate it. So I sent the website to her that I had found in the way that I thought the, the information needed to be presented. And from my understanding of what the um, site selectors look for in a city and for their locations. And so I got that to her and her team started working on um, an app for us. So they're going to show you this evening the application that they were able to put forward our, our, um, uh, our team put all the materials together and, um, and it's situated the way we really thought it would look the best. So I'm going to turn it over. Is Joe going to present or are you Molly? Joe is. Joe. Joe Zebert from the Planning Commission is going to go ahead and present to you what they came up with for the city, this great partnership that we have. Okay. Um, so basically we're just going to dive right into it. We have the retail applicant. Oh, Joe my name is Zebert. Joe Zebert with Regional Planning Commission. Um, so again, we'll dive right into it. Um, if you look at the screens around you, we do have what we call the Retail Opportunity Springfield, which is a retail web application that we built for the Office of Planning and Economic Development. And you know, in our world, this is called an application, but really it's just an interactive web page that allows people to kind of kind of scroll around and, and click on things and get information at their fingertips. And basically what we use is a story map for this application. And as you can see at the top, you know, there's several chapters with that. We have an introduction, we have major retail hubs, neighborhood retail hubs, and then economic incentive areas. Um, as you scroll down to the left, just like a book, um, you'll see how the app just generally talks about City of Springfield, it gets people some information so they kind of get, get familiar with the City of Springfield. As you scroll down, just like the book, you tend to turn the page, and illustration also changes on the other page. But what you can get from this site is just general facts, such as the population from the city of Springfield, about the city of Springfield, according to the 29 ESRI estimate, as well as characteristics of the capital city. It also talks about our transportation network and how we're well connected with rail, with, um, you know, with, with our planes, and um, it also talks about our higher education as well. Um, as you see, when you turn the page, you notice the illustration on the right. Those points on there represent various retail hubs. The ones in orange are the major retail hubs, and the other ones in blue are neighbor, neighborhood retail hubs. We're not quite complete, completed with neighborhood retail hubs. We just want to show you how this can be expanded. So what you see here tonight can always be built upon. Um, if you click on a tab at the top, which would be the second chapter, you can, 
can refer to it as. Um, there will be a web map that loads, and on the right you can see the various locations. Again, we did work with Val and her office, and they did have a retail study um, that was done within over the last year or so, and it did establish some retail centers. As you scroll down on the left, again, as you turn the page and keep going down, as you get to a new page, a new area will show up. In this case, it's White Oaks area, and you can get various information. We're always getting questions or phone calls from developers asking for you know, various facts about the city of Springfield. And in this um, fact sheet you can see up there, we have it broken down by one and three and five mile radius. Um, the information on there, again, is by, you know, there's population, median household income, and total employment. Things potential retailers may want to know as they're looking into the city of Springfield. The map on the right, you can tell there's some various colors on that map. Um, various shades of blue, the darker the color, the higher the population per that census geography. You can click on that block group as Ethan did and it'll then give you the total population. If you zoom out a little bit further, um, you can also get it by the census track, which is more the larger um, census geography, or then you can zoom in and then get you know, the census blocks. Blocks make up groups, more refined data as you go in. If you zoom in even further, we do have you know, the aerial photography that's out there. This is as of 2015. Currently, the 2019 aerial that we had flown is being QAQC as we speak, and we will update that as soon as it gets completed. As you keep continuing to scroll down on the left, you get various information about that retail hub. And if you keep going down, we have um, some drone footage that Bell's office had flown with the retail study, which gives um, that person looking at that site some additional you know, additional perspective of what's actually there without being there to help you draw them in a little bit more. Um, and we have those embedded within this application as well. If you continue to scroll down, you'll kind of, you'll see another, um, aerial, um, another drone footage that's available for you to view, as well as some of the other um, major retail hubs that we have on this app. If you go to the next tab at the top, um, this is something that, you know, we're kind of tweaking. It won't be shown right away. Um, when we go live, we'll mainly focus on introduction as well as the major retail hubs. But just to give people a little bit more um, refined, you know, some more neighborhood retail areas, we will have the same type of information available on this page as well per each site. And then lastly, we have the last tab, which involves the economic incentives. Um, you know, we worked quite extensively with, with the Office of Planning and Economic Development um, earlier in the year to produce some TIF maps and review the TIF maps that are out there now. So we reviewed all the legals and um, refined those TIF maps, which now are available on your website. If you turn on, so this is just an interactive web map that's a part of this application. You can, on the left, you can turn on TIF districts, which Ethan did. You can zoom into that, click on it, and then it'll tell you the information on when the TIF was created, when it's gonna expire, and also link you up to the most latest PDF that we have on your website that Ethan actually in the back created. I'm Ethan Hendricks, who's kind of um, the person behind the curtain right now. He's pretty much, a did, he's the person that did all the work on this. And um, I definitely think it's an application that we can use going forward. Are there any questions? Um, when will this be live? Um, we're thinking about two weeks or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a lot of information, thank you. Yes. It is, and we continually can build off of it too, so. It is a lot of information. For the record, I'm Molly Behrens, and I'm the executive director of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission. And thank you, Alderman or Alderman, for that question. Right now, we are still in a beta test. Um, we want to give plenty of time for Julia Freebert, your director of communications, to look over the content in terms of the messaging and work directly with Val's office. We have this partnership, as you know, a planning and services agreement between the city of Springfield and our office to develop projects like this. But ultimately, even though it is a partnership, the content still belongs to the city. And so we're just dotting the I's and crossing the final T's. And we're hoping within two to three weeks to go live with this project. Thank you. It's really impressive. So does anybody else have any other questions for cool. the guys? So it was my understanding when this first started was we were trying to identify um, retail opportunity centers. Mm -hmm. Is that 
also wrapped up in there outside of the currently yeah. established zones. Right, and it's mostly the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. you know, and we're trying to align it also with our comprehensive plan. You know, we wanted to align that, that area, but it also, with the study, it identified more, you know, some of our major retail hubs are pretty obvious. Right. Um, but it's the neighborhood hubs that are so important to me and, and for us to get out there. So that's where we're really working on right now. We wanted to really dig in further and then, like I said, align it with the comprehensive plan, too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things I'd like to see on there is like Sangam Center North, small mm -hmm. retail hub, mm -hmm. and South Gertrude Parkway. Capital City Shopping Center it's, and the, the hotels and all that stuff. Yes, we, that is part of it. Yes. E Ethan, could you go back to South Dirksen, please, uh -huh. as one of the areas that has already been identified? And it's a major. We mm -hmm. considered it a major. If you remember back to the comprehensive plan, um, the, the plan identified neighborhood commercial areas, and they're the, the obvious places we always think of in terms of the major commercial, like Alderman Fragenzi just mentioned, but also the smaller areas, like Laurel, that goes um, from MacArthur Boulevard East. The comprehensive plan also identifies a mechanism by which the city could encourage development in those smaller areas. Those were called special opportunity areas, where some resources in terms of whether they be TIF funds or other economic development expansion type funds could be utilized. And basically, it just requires the city to say, we want this area to be a special opportunity area, and then we're going to gear our resources, both financial and also some planning resources to those areas. So one of the things in the tabs that we hope to identify is those areas as well. Um, and working with Val's office to kind of help that process and then move forward through an actual planning process for those areas as well. Val, we got, uh, we got South Town in there. Yes, yeah, South Town is one. All yes. Right. Mm -hmm. all Definitely. Right. Yes, sir. Right. I'm you, good. Come on, bring them, because right. I may have forgotten no. something, but yeah. It's all no. good. Thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. 11th Street, you can see. Mm -hmm. What about West Jefferson? <laughs> West Jefferson. <laughs> How far west? <laughs> Way west. <laughs> Way west. west nope, sorry, at this point I don't, but happy to do At that. this point, it, it's you. not yeah. on there, but it is. I mean, it's the obvious, the North Grand Avenue corridor, um, the ones that we would normally South think Park. of, the Innes Park area. But the, the neighborhood, as Joe mentioned, when this does go live, the neighborhood tab will not be um, made live. We're going to hide it because additional work needs to be done on that. Right. Um, so we're going to go live and forward with the first two obvious things, and then through consulting through um, with Val's office and all of you, then we can actually add to the neighborhood neighborhoods as well. So yeah. is Sangamon Center North on there as a major retail hub? I... Sangamon... Yes. Don't I we have Sangamon on there? But 19th and Sangamon. Pardon? 19th, 19th and Sangamon. Sangamon. No, yeah. We do not have that yet. Okay, let's get that on there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So in any time you have any other ideas, please let us know because we want to make sure. And well, how often did you going to update it? The nice, it was, yeah, go ahead. The nice <laughs> thing about um, involving the Regional Planning Commission in this is that any time it needs to be updated, it's literally a phone call away <laughs> and then just scheduling the staff time, but we're talking days, not weeks or months. Um, they, the, that's the, the benefit to our office being able to do some of these things for you versus using an outside private consultant. First of all, it would be more expensive and more costly, but then the updating would be a problem. So as our office becomes aware of the data that's behind this, for example, the census data, the population mm -hmm. data, those kinds of things, then we'll be updating that in real time, essentially, as a matter of a couple of days is when the update would occur. Can, can real quick, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, um, can you drill down on this to even to like show what's zoned a certain all the way down to that granular or, or it's just a more high no, level? No, it does not. It does not go into the zoning district because at some point in time you have too much data and the right. whole system crashes. So it does not go down into that. It goes into types of... Of, of businesses that would be allowed, be, be similar to that, but it does not drill down to the zoning layer because the zoning layer map, as you know, is a, a, um, an unwieldy little beast. Right. It can be. And so that would be a, a separate. And actually, the whole point of this is have it on the web, but then drive them to people in right. Val's right. office who can actually 
be their, their Springfield consultant if somebody is looking to, to site here. We want it to drill down into Val's office, right. who then can take it from the zoning and the development standpoint and, and, and actually from, customize. Right, and this is built for a site selector. Right. You know, and so if, they're, if they have the interest, then they are going to call because we get those calls all the time. Okay. Yeah. What about, I know this isn't in the city, but the fairgrounds itself would be a great draw for people coming here to put on an event. Well, um, Mo Molly might just do this for the county, huh? <laughs> well, it's, well, it's one something of, that's tied to the city. Yes, absolutely. It is. And, and one of my, and I, I think I've mentioned this to several people before, one of my um, personal things is that when jobs are created in Springfield, the whole county benefits. When then jobs are created in unincorporated Sangamon County, the city benefits. You know, just, you know, the, there's businesses all throughout the county that everyone benefits from. So this is developed for the city of Springfield, but certainly this type of application has applicability throughout the county and almost a regional type approach. So your point is very well taken, that this application could be actually replicated to include other areas as well. Having said that, this is also geared specifically to retail developers for Val's office. But that doesn't mean that it couldn't be a stepping off point for other types of, of developers and job attraction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'll just brag a little bit more on them. When I looked at this storytelling application out, trying to look, they started at about $15,000, $18,000. So thanks to our partnership, we were able to get this done. Nice job. And thank you very much. Not to say I wouldn't also take an additional check from this thing, <laughs> just saying. I, I, I just wanted to clarify that. So this is already included as part of our, our partnership, and you, you aren't actually... This, this particular <laughs> app is included this year in your planning and services agreement and ongoing maintenance. But keeping in mind, we also do serve as a consultant of things like this. We, we just happen to have a, a small amount of downtime, and I was able to put the, the right staff people on this project to get it done in an expedited manner. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So once it goes Other live, questions? once it goes live, could we all just be notified? Yes, absolutely yeah. you will. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right, any other questions or um, concerns or ideas, please just let well us done. know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Next, we have ordinances table to remain in committee. Mr. Clerk, would you like 2017, to read 2017-103, 2018-110, 2019-008, 2019-276, 2019-430, 2019-483, 2019-484, 2019-485, does anybody like to move any of those? Uh, yes, I would like to withdraw 2019-483. We're going to be representing with a different ordinance. Okay. Which is 483? The net meter. Okay. I'm going to start all over. Now for the ordinances for committee consideration, CWLP. 2019, 493, an ordinance approving change order number one and authorizing additional funding in an amount of $31,479 with Toshiba, Toshiba American Energy Systems Corporation for the inspection and maintenance of the Dalman Power Plant unit number four turbine for a total amount payable of $231,879 for the Office of Public Utilities. Move for consent. consent. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Motion passes. 2019-494, and in order approving a contract extension and addendum and authorizing additional funding in an amount of $220,000 with a Ascend Performance Materials Operations LLC for the purchase of debasic acid in a total amount not to exceed $1,540,000 for the Office of Public Utilities. Consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any against? Motion passes. Public Safety, 2019-484, an ordinance authorizing the purchase of five defibrillators plus accessories and spare parts from Zoll Medical Corporation in an amount not to exceed $163,138.30 for the Springfield Fire Department. Move to consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? Yes. Where, where, are these, where are these going to be located at? On the trucks or... 
You're the only fireman in here. <laughs> well, the chief must have stepped out. I thought you were standing behind me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. They will be. They'll be located on the trucks. Are we they, actually... Are, are they replacing other ones? or they, they are. They're replacing the other ones. We actually need more than that, but this is a start. Okay. So, okay. Thanks a lot. Sorry about that. Conley? He asked my question. There he is now. No, you're good. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion passes. Public Works 2019-485, an ordinance authorizing execution of a preliminary engineering agreement for the Churchill Road bridge over the Old Jacksonville branch, MFT section 19-00487-00-BR, SN 084-60000, with WHKS and company, engineering in an amount not to exceed $198,952 for the Office of Public Works. Move for consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion passed. 2019-486, a resolution notifying the State of Illinois Department of Transportation that motor fuel tax funds in an amount of $198,952 may be used for the Churchill Road over the Old Jacksonville Branch, MFT section number 19-00487-00-BR for the Office of Public Works. Move for consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? Do I have a motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion passes. Finance, 2019-488, an ordinance levying and assessing taxes to partially fund the statutory con contribution of the police and fire pension funds. Move to debate. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion passes. 2019-489, an ordinance authorizing a three-year three contract with banner fire equipment for the purchase of personal protective equipment incorporated consisting of coats and pants with the potential of a 3% increase on January 1st every year for the next three years for an amount not to exceed $270,000 for the Springfield Fire Department. Moved consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Motion passes. 2019 490, an ordinance authorizing an agreement with HSHS Medical Group to administer drug and alcohol testing for potential new hires and for current employees in compliance with federal regulations and authorizing payment in an amount not to exceed $80,000 from January 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2022 for the Office of Human Resources. Moved. Senate. Second. Any discussion? Is this bid? Yeah, that's. Was this bid Thank out? Thank you. Yes, we did an RFP. We did get four responses, and this was the low Thank bid you. vendor. A follow-up question, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jim, do we test all applicants um, before they're hired? All new hires are tested, yes. Regardless of category, regardless Correct. of classification? Correct. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion General City Business, 2019-491, an ordinance amending Chapter 110 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended pertaining to cable and video service provider and PEG fees. Move, Move to, to debate. debate. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Motion. Mayor, Mr. Chair, this is a question for our mayor. Does this pertain to I-3? Yes. Um, this, uh, this particular uh, section is new to the city code. Uh, the uh, state law provides for authority for uh, certain uh, uh, defined companies to be able to operate uh, its business within uh, the public right-of-ways of any city. In order for the city to uh, properly uh, have some input and or monitor that process, this ordinance is a component of that state law that allows the cities to adopt an ordinance if they go the route, if the company goes the route of taking the state authority through the Commerce Commission instead of a franchise agreement. So this provides certain abilities of the city to uh, impose both uh, fees and also monitor the uh, uh, company's activities under the state law provisions and allows the city then to enforce certain of those provisions. If we do not adopt this, uh, this type of an ordinance, uh, then it's up to the Attorney General's office. 
So this is to allow a local authority to interact with that state law. Follow-up question. Ms. Uh, so <laughs> if we were to not pass this ordinance, um, for example, in the case of I-3, where we've had activity in wards uh, 9 and 10, would the uh, cable and uh, optics um, companies be allowed to get into the easements, easements, even if we did not have this ordinance? That's the question. Yes. Okay, that's what I wanted to confirm, because we had a lot of public comments out there that somehow the city council um, has authority to allow or disallow the fiber act optic activity and and uh, what we're hearing from our city attorney is that the city council has got uh, no discretion to um, prevent access to the easements and and that is correct in other words I, and i do think we did talk briefly about this uh, prior to this time but uh, the uh, state law provisions allow for a company a, a certain defined companies to apply for authority to operate within the uh, public right-of-ways without a local franchise agreement. And uh, in this case, uh, this is one of the first instances where that uh, circumstance has occurred. So that state law provides that a city may adopt an ordinance uh, such as this, and this actually is based off the uh, Illinois Municipal League kind of model ordinance with some, some modifications. Uh, to basically address that uh, circumstance because there's at least one other company that is uh, uh, proceeding in that same manner. And there's another provision of the law not directly related to this that we're also working on a similar ordinance uh, having to do with the ability to use the right-of-way without having a local franchise agreement. And my last comment is that uh, I believe I3 personnel have worked uh, diligently uh, after comments from our homeowners and so forth to uh, be responsive to concerns and uh, I believe we've got three gentlemen or more uh, here tonight and uh, likewise they came to the Ward 7 town hall meeting and they came to the Ward 8 town hall meeting, is that correct? So I think I3 is doing what they can to try to address problems and fix problems that are out there. So I just want to add that. Alderman Donnan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could uh, you explain a little bit further, uh, Corporation Council, the fees that would be imposed and, and, and if we have any estimated revenues that that would bring to the city? Um, we, do not, uh, we do not have estimated uh, revenues uh, in relation to, for example, I-3, but this would impose the same type of arrangement as if we had a local franchise agreement of 5%. And that's allowed specifically under the state law, called out in the state law, if the city adopts the ordinance. And Otherwise, then there would be no fees paid. And where does that revenue go? Uh, I believe it would just be part of general revenues, you know, for corporate fund or just general revenues of the city. That's a good answer. Thank you. Alderman <laughs> Redpen. Corporation Council, there's a similar uh, situation going on with the Ameren Gas Company who's putting the gas snifters out on the poles and... I think they attempted to put them on our utility poles, and we did not allow that. But now they're putting them in the right-of-ways. And one of the businesses in my area, the pizza ranch down on South 6, they put this pole right up in front of their sign so they can't, can't read their, their uh, menus and stuff off the bat. Is this, is this the same state law that, falls, that they would fall under, too? Because now they're, they're sticking them up in the right-of-ways. I know there's also one out on Sangamon Avenue by Aldi, uh, John, and you were Doris's area right there. So, um, You may recall that uh, Ameren uh, Gas and Ameren Electric both have local uh, franchise agreements with the city. So the, this particular state law that uh, we're talking about tonight does not apply or is not affected, uh, uh, does not apply to the Ameren situation, but we have a local franchise agreement that allows Ameren to operate within the right-of-way areas under certain supervision. So uh, each and every one of those locations or signs has to be approved by the uh, city. So if there's a specific complaint, then the appropriate uh, departments, either by way of public works or the utility, uh, might be able to address the sign location. That's the case. And it, it, I th just think it's remarkable that they would put a pole right up in front of a business sign. And so I will, I guess, get with you, Doug. Is that correct? 
If we could get just the address, that's something oh, where we could check. Okay, I'll talk to Nate afterwards, but uh, if we just have some common courtesy to not do that to businesses, that'd be good. Alderwoman DeCenso. Uh, we were, thank you. We were recently, uh, all the older people received a list of locations where the um, I-3 was going in. Is there any way that could be made public? Because as this goes along, people are asking, where is this going to go? You know, should I be prepared? So it would be nice if people had a little bit of a heads up instead of just showing, you know, people showing up put sticking stuff in their yards and not knowing what's going on. Can we make that, can we publish that somewhere? Mr. Josh Bradbury, would you like to? <coughs> It'd be a great business practice, wouldn't it? It would be an excellent business practice. Yeah. It, would, it would also give residents the opportunity to know that if there is some damage to their property that they do have recourse and not just right. allow it to fall. Yeah, thank you for your question. Absolutely, we, um, we we do anticipate. Could we have your name? I'm record? sorry, Josh Bradbury with I3 Broadband. And um, we, we have communicated to all the residents and, and the presentation we'll be giving um, tonight, we'll, we'll kind of go through what that looked like. Uh, we, for, for competitive reasons, we don't broadcast a large area of what we're doing far in advance, but we do, um, we, we do do that before any drills are in the ground or any construction begins. Uh, we communicate with every resident in every neighborhood. Okay, I just know that other areas of town that have already had this didn't know what was going on or didn't know what was happening in their yards. That's so true. we don't, I, I looked at the list and saw several uh, in my area and <laughs> I don't want the angry phone calls, you know, what's going on in my yard? So, cause I know they, the, the three on the end here have received them and I just think we need to be very transparent going forward uh, I understand it's a business, but at the same time, if this affects people's, you know, yards. They need to know what's going on. Absolutely, and, and you know, we, we're in a very small area so so far. I mean, we've only been to about 600 homes is is who we've affected, and, and we've uh, given multiple communications to, to each of them prior to any kind of any construction beginning. So I, I know sometimes those are we did both um, mailers, which can easily be thrown away or, or not read. We also hand delivered um, bags with, informational bags with candy for the kids. It was a Halloween themed bag um, with invitations to come and meet us at a Papo's Cafe, get a free coffee and, and communicate exactly what's going on. Um, we were at the Ward 7 and 8 meetings as well to try to get the word out as much as possible. Um, so we have gone to each single door individually, knocked on them. We followed up with, with further communications with them. So, um, yeah, we, we certainly are, are working to, to make that process better. We'll continue to improve on that. Sure. Alderman Hanau. I think the, the frustrating part for, I think, one of my neighborhoods was the first, one of the first that had it done. And it was done in the spring. And... You know, so people are kind of fired up about getting their yard done. All of a sudden, there's marks in their yard. There's flags everywhere. And I mean, they're, they were everywhere um, from the locators. Sure. And um, it would have been one thing had they put the flags up for, and then they would have gotten done in a week or so. But some of them were there for a long time, and I was getting a lot of complaints. And then, you know, as you dig and whatever, um, they were just complaining. I got complaints that things weren't done in a timely manner. Now, granted, you could deal with the rain and the weather and whatever, but um, the, the, the loc locator flags was one of the biggest complaints I had because, um, you know, people are trying to get their yard in shape and, and, and that. So um, that, that was, and, and I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea what was going on. I'm getting bombarded by calls. Sure. We had, we, had, we had absolutely no idea. Thanks for your question, Alderman Hanauer. We, I, I do appreciate that. We, we um, you know, as, as often as the case when there's construction projects going on, they all seem to get lumped together. So just to be clear, we, we'll show you later on exactly where we are, we are, we are building currently. We started that in, in October of this year. So I, I know we, we had listened there's to another the, company is the same kind of deal. Though, there was another company, I believe it was Ameren, that was in, it was in the neighborhood was, earlier this like, spring. It, I thought it was a third I mean, party. Per, per, perhaps it was AT. It, it, it was a, it was a different it was. company. That, I can assure you it wasn't us it, either way, but your message is still heard and understood. Mr. Bradbury, the council is ready for your presentation. Do, um, thank you. I'm sorry. 
Alderman Conley. Alderman. Well, I was I was just going to say, if you're going to do your presentation too, but um, just so everyone at the council hears what was said at, at um, my Ward 8 meeting, I think one of the other complaints that came up in addition to not that I, you know, to bombard you with complaints, because there were people who, who are excited about this too and would like some more options for, for internet. Um, but it's, it's the trucks and the size of them. And I just want to say um, these gentlemen were at my meeting, stayed after to talk to people who still had um, concerns. Um, so just moving forward, I know for other wards and other neighborhoods, the truck locations for those big, I don't know, spools of wire or whatever, um, that, that was definitely awkward. and. Um, interfered a lot with, with neighborhoods. So I know that's something that you agreed to keep in mind as you moving forward. So just head everyone off on some of the phone calls you might be getting. Absolutely, that's why it was, um, we're, we're so thankful to be here, to be able to, to make the, the, the contact with you all. So you know who to contact and, and who, to, who, to, who to touch when, if, if you do you get inquiries from your residents. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you all for your time. My name is Brian Olson. I'm the general manager of I3 Broadband. Uh, Brandon Henricks, director of engineering. And I'm Damian Collins, director of uh, additions and operations in Springfield. <clears throat> um, you know, I know this is kind of a, an add-on to last week's conversation. And again, thank you. Um, for both the, the time we were given at the at the seven and the, the ward eight meetings, unfortunately, I think we had missed the opportunity. The, uh, I think I believe it was the week earlier for the the ward ten meeting. Um, you know, we as, as Josh mentioned, we we did begin uh, a small amount of the network construction in ward ten. Just I think it was last it was last Monday, I believe, was the first time we had, had done that. Um, you'll see here in our presentation that's that's actually. Kind of adding on to, to Val and her staff's conversation, that's it, our network's being built there now to, to, to feed our new retail store. Where we're going to be uh, uh, taking occupancy as of Sunday. So it's pretty exciting. Um, just a, a brief, brief presentation here. I know there's probably going to be lots of you know, questions, but we'll, we'll try and be mindful of your time. So we're, we're a company that started in one form or another serving internet service, uh, dial-up in the, in the mid-90s, transitioned as a, as a CLEC, um, a competitive local exchange carrier providing phone and internet service. Uh, and in early 2000s, in about 2003, it laid our first fiber optic infrastructure, served some of the businesses throughout downtown Peoria and Pekin, Illinois. Uh, in 2000, uh, 10 is when we, late 2009 and 2010 is when we had really uh, gone for a strategy of triple play, fiber to the home, 100% fiber underground infrastructure, uh, and, and to really challenge uh, the services and service, uh, the, and customer services uh, that are being provided by the, the, the big companies, uh, the, the named unnamed big companies. Um, that was a successful launch in 2009-10, and we had grown it up and in 2014, uh, formed a partnership with Champaign-Urbana and the University of Illinois, began serving the, the greater uh, Champaign-Urbana area as well to add to the Peoria area. 2018, we had uh, acquired a company in uh, uh, the East Bay of Rhode Island, uh, and we now faithfully grow and operate that company as well. Um, 2019, here we are, it's a very exciting time for us. We're launching our, our fourth market now. Um, we're, I, I say we're excited. I, it, you can't imagine, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're very excited. So um, to talk a little bit more about the construction and keep on top of that update is, is, is Josh. Thank you. We already, already touched on some of this and just wanted to make sure everyone was aware, you know, that, that we, we're, we're, we're diligently trying to communicate and, and make sure the word is out of not just what we're doing, but who to call, who to contact. We, we want to fix any problems before they become problems, ideally. And, and um, so we, we did send these, these postcards that you see that first one is what we typically send to every neighborhood that we construct and historically have. Um, it's designed as not to be a sales tool. It is just an intention and an information tool that we're coming to your area. We know that that gets thrown away half the time and people have questions. So that's why we decided to go door to door. We took the, those Halloween bags as depicted in the slide here um, that contained the, um, 
two of the pieces of information that are in your in your packets there. One that was a letter from Brian to the residents. Um, a second that was a frequently asked questions letter. And then thirdly, we had the, the free co coffee invitation to come join us um, at Popples. We talked to dozens of residents and had a, had a very positive experience getting to know many of those residents. This is always done before any drills are in the ground. I'd Please. like to add one thing to the attention letter. It's, it, you know, the, there's another component to, to saying or, or being notified. And I think what we discovered, in, in particular, Aaron, at, at, at your ward meeting, was the, the conversation had had escaped us and into social media. And and when it had gotten to that, it's 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 going outside of the boundary in which we're actually constructing. And right, so but it's within the boundary of the group of social media. And so what I think what was happening is is we notified a, a certain portion of people that we're actually doing construction for. But then what we, I think we were discovering and through talking to some of those residents is they felt like they weren't being notified, but they were being notified on social media that something was happening in the, the area, but they weren't notified because we're not constructing at their house or, or past their house. Or, um, so I wanted to make sure that if we lose the, 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 the polygon of, of, of the discussion, the discussion polygon isn't necessarily matching our construction polygon. I think the app you're dancing around is next door. The next door app is where a lot of there was a lot of conversation about this. All of it, yeah. It's yeah. The, it's and it, it and it is. It's getting outside of it, and so it's. I heard about this, and it's happening in our neighborhood, but but it's really not as yeah. defined by the neighborhood we're actually constructing. And so I think that is a thought we have to to, to contemplate. And just one further communication we did give as well was um, we sent a letter that, that would have got to the homes yesterday. So it was just a follow up, um, what the status of construction is, um, assuring people that we will not be doing any construction over the over the holiday weekend, um, and that we'd be vacating on on Wednesday and coming back to, to continue and finish up on, on on next Monday. Does that include moving all the trucks? They will be moved to. Smaller areas, and Brandon can speak to that. Yeah, okay. no, I, they won't just suddenly disappear. But one of the things, uh, and a lot of that came from the meeting at Ward Eight, was uh, making sure they're off of the made the most major roads. Um, Turning Mill and Spring Mill were two specific examples. Yeah. Uh, I drove through the neighborhood tonight and found that there was a piece of equipment parked on Spring Mill. There shouldn't have been for a couple of days, so I've already spoken to the foreman about getting that moved. Um, but they, they, one thing they have to balance against, right? You specifically, by statute, cannot block driveways, mailboxes, things of that nature. So there are only so many places to put the different pieces. But as soon as they're finished up with a piece and no longer need it, they're moving it out. Um, and that really, it's just, that it's a weekend where people have a lot of people at their house. Oh, no house, doubt. And, so. and some houses might have 20 cars needing to park in different areas of the yep. right of way to be near them. So you know, we understand that, and um, you know, we've taken an additional step to try and get some some consolidation of those spaces in more commercial areas where we can. Um, but it's 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 sort of a juggling act, you know. So right. Thank so you. aware of it and trying to trying to do better, but we know um, we know they're going to be there, and that's probably going to uh, frustrate a few people. So I'll, I'll pass on the emails. Oh, no, please do. Please do. We, we, yeah, do. yeah. Okay. Please have them contact us. I mean, that, okay. that's really that really is you know the number one goal at the end of the day. If there's a problem with what we're doing, we want to know about it so we can okay, correct thank it. Thank you. So, are you guys going to be direct competition with uh, Xfinity, uh, Comcast? We we like to believe they're they are no competition to us, but yes. It, okay. The traditional answer, yeah. Um, so. Um, where, where, how far along are you in the city? Where are you at? Where are you at, Val? Well, we'll have a slide a little bit later that'll show exactly where the initial construction okay. area is. And, and okay. Uh, um, to the aldermen that have been affected so far, if, if you've had complaints, I understand. And how were those taken care of? Were they taken care of? Um, once we figured out what was, what was going on, my I actually the the first emails and and contacts I got were, why do I have flags in my yard. And I think we they already covered that. The flags were probably out for longer than was great for everyone. Um, I, I've had, it's been a mixed bag. I've heard from people who've said, I don't need this, I don't want this, I don't want you in my yard. Um, well, that's different than having complaints about things that are going on is what I'm asking. Yes, are, are and then I would say, but the then we got to the complaints. About, yeah, there were, there were some very specific incidents that were, um, Damage was caused, um, and to my understanding, those have been resolved. I don't think there's any outstanding issues yeah, with hard. the people who had to be taken, leave their house for the for overnight, and 
Uh, are you referring to, there was, a, there was a gas line that was hit right. due to not being marked by uh, the company that responds on behalf of Ameren, USIC, when a Julie Locate is called in. So this was on the backside of Cokey Mill. The line yep. was not marked at all, so our contractors didn't know to expose it when they crossed it and did damage it. Um, okay. And then there was something. also some damage to the fence for the um, the Cokie Mill um, yep. Neighborhood Association. We had we had actually had coincidentally had a meeting with Public Works that day. Uh, we're in the field. They mentioned that, and before we left town, about three hours later, they had already fixed it. So. Okay. So follow up so, to my question to the other alderman. Uh, I've sat on the council close to 30 years, so I've seen a lot of people come, a lot of people go, and everybody comes up here with great in, uh, intentions of doing the right thing. I, 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 I'm not doubting that your that your intentions are good, but Corporation Council, my question to you is: if we uh, approve this, if if they don't follow through with the follow up on the maintenance, is there recourse for us? If the uh, if the ordinance. Um is adopted, then that allows us to uh, enforce the provisions of state law. Uh, if we do not adopt a local ordinance, then it would be up to complaints to the Attorney General's office to enforce it. So the um, mechanism, because of the authority being granted under the state law provisions through the Commerce Commission, uh, this mechanism of, the, of adopting a local ordinance is allowed under that state law is the only manner in which the city would have the uh, potential ability to monitor and or enforce certain customer standards. Okay. And it's not that I'm picking on you, but just understand, we, we get this. And, and just want to make sure, I wish you luck because I get more complaints about cable TV in Springfield with Xfinity and Com Comcast and then probably I get from public works or utilities and police and fire it all together. So believe me, people are ready for competition. Okay? Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments before I carry on? Do you have more of your presentation? Uh, or is this the end of it? Just no, there are. I, I think There's a few more slides. Maybe we can hold more. the comments till after you present it all. Sure. Sure. Um, so this, the flags, once, you, once construction, once you've been notified that construction is coming, this is what you'll see. First thing will be flags showing up, and you'll see the equipment into your neighborhood. And ultimately, as the building process is taking place, you will see holes, you will see cones, you will see tarps with dirt on it while it's being set aside and properly taken care of, and you will see pipes sticking out of the ground. So that's kind of the, the, the making process. That's peeking behind the curtain and seeing what's happening. Uh, where's the, oh, thank you. Um, so there on the left, you'll see a very specific location in one of the areas that we were building. Did get a call from that resident, uh, basically came home and saw that, and that was his first inclination. Did not, did not see the construction mailer. Um, gave us a call and said, what, what's going on? And you know, we talked about that. You see less than two days later, the picture on the right is what it looks like. Um, I think the important thing to communicate here is that we did nothing different because of that call. We just assured him that we'll do what we always do and take care of it, and this is, this is what it looks like when it gets finished. So if you go to some of the areas where we've been working at the beginning and wrapped up the process, that's what the finished product looks like. Good. Some of the areas where we just started moving into Ward 10, for example, look much more like the, the site on the left. But over the, the course of the next week or two... Well, that's what Ward 10 looks like all the time. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, something that, that I think is a little more unique to us uh, is that we've, we've worked with Pearly Cable Construction for over 10 years now, doing our residential fiber to the home builds. Um, we've used a number of contractors over the years for smaller projects, but the reason we've stuck with Pearly is the quality, the expectations. They, they understand that our success is driven directly by their competency and quality of work. Um, it does us no good to lay a state-of-the-art fiber optic infrastructure if they just tear everybody's yard up and everybody hates us the second we leave. So um, that would be a really foolish investment. So we have a, a long relationship with them. They're very responsive, both to residents and to us. Um, but that said, we operate under a trust but verify policy. So after they're done and do all of their internal quality checks, uh, our, our teams that come through and do the final terminations of the fiber optic cables, one of their biggest jobs is also to do the QC, the audit of the work, ensure that everything was done to specifications. Um, and anything that they feel was missed or hasn't been addressed in a timely enough fashion is brought back to the attention of Pearly Cable for them to clean up. Um, and then if, and, and so I oversee all of those phases, but then if my guys aren't doing their job and the contractors aren't doing their job, if somehow something slips through the cracks, um, that's when the door-to-door -door teams will be available. And they're also, uh, you know, their number one job is to touch base with the residents and just make sure, again, 
that all of those issues have been taken care of before they even ever have to reach out to us separately and bring them to us. And Josh can speak more to that. So yeah, that, that's their, their number one goal is to ensure that the customer's happy because whether they become a customer now or a year from now, if they're not happy with what we've done to their property, they'll never be a customer and it'll be a failed investment for us. So we, we've done this in thousands of neighborhoods and if we don't do a good job, we fail. And we, we haven't failed in any of those neighborhoods yet. So um, again, unique to Springfield is that we've hired someone dedicated, um, Damian Collins. Um, he's an industry veteran here. He's a local Springfield resident. And uh, we brought him on board this, this summer um, to, to be dedicated. We, right now we have zero customers. And Damian is a, a full-time employee to in, oversee and ensure that construction onboarding customers once we get to that phase and everything else down the road is going to be um, held to the standards that we do everything else that, that, that we do in our existing communities. Um, this is our footprint right, right here, right now. If you can see, um, Brandon, help me with the streets. There's that Co Cokie Mill on the east. Mm -hmm. uh, on the east is Veterans. I'm sorry, east, the east side of that is Veterans and we go just west of Cokie Mill um, in the further southwest corner there. Um, about this little over 600 homes is what is what we're, we're we're constructing right now. This year we wanted to have a very soft opening. Um, we wanted to make sure that we create the relationships with with you all, with the city, uh, with the people that are, are very important for us to continue to have a successful deployment in Springfield, um, as well as we wanted to open a retail space, which we will be taking control of on on um, well, Sunday. Sunday, but mo probably not until Monday because I'm not coming in on Sunday, and then um, it'll be open probably the beginning um, January one is, is our goal. So um, it's kind of where we're going. 2020, we'll, we'll look to have um, a more broad deployment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot, uh, this is really just a response to some of the, the questions we've heard from the various different either residents or city uh, staff. Uh, um, you know, so what it's really what is this fire deployment? Why is it important to the community? Um, how are how have we been successful right i guess those are the, the handful of questions so really we've been successful we we just this year again so proud um we were named by broadband now as the second fastest in the nation for fastest overall internet speed provided to consumers we're rated fifth in the nation for customer approval that's pretty extraordinary in an industry devoid of customer service right i just i hope everyone hears that um, because that's, that is what separates us, right? Um, that fence being fixed by the time we leave uh, the neighborhood. That, that's not going to happen with any of our competitors. Uh, none, none of those, you know, I said it at, I think, your meeting. You know, we're not a huge company, but we're not a small company. What, what we are is the perfect size company to be able to hear a problem and respond to it. Um, you know, in, in the uh, packet you all have, there's an FAQ. That's the FAQ that went out to all the residents. Fiber optics is the next generation of, of infrastructure being placed in the, throughout the entire United States. This is not new. Um, you know, in, in, in the FAQ, it you know, points out 100 years ago were the, the first electric and, and telephone networks being placed. And that was a 50-year project. Um, you know, in the 60s through the 80s, the coax, you know, the cable companies had wired America for, for the, the, the coax uh, infrastructure. Well, the time's come and most of America is being deployed with the fiber optic infrastructure and that's what we're here doing, right? We're, we're setting the network for our next generation. Um, we've met with uh, some of the folks at CWLP, um, had great conversations. Um, we've, we've discovered uh, really our network and our business can be the perfect complement. Again, few people have asked if there was, if, if we're, we're representing competition to the CWLP fiber network. The answer is no, we're a complement. Um, and obviously for all the consumers in, in, the, in the community, co competition just drives down prices. We've proven that over the last 15 years. Everywhere we deploy our network, the competition lowers their prices. All, all residents safe. Um, so, you know, it, you know, we'll, we'll ask people, and people have that same discussion of. I, th I think it was you who said it. Um, you know, I might not even want this in my yard. Um, well, that's fine, but they can still enjoy the lower prices from their existing provider. Is, is my my standard answer? No, I don't that. want you. I don't want yeah. you. I don't want you. <laughs> Um, and then just from, from, from those savings to the consumers, from the ability for people to work from home, from having a, a high capacity, reliable connection um, to enterprise attractiveness to a community, 
uh, for us coming in, creating jobs. I mean, obviously, it's, it's a multifaceted economic driver. Um, anything to add to that? <laughs> so, um, that, that? Thus concludes our presentation, <laughs> and if you have any other questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Any discussion? Any questions? No, I think we'll just we'll direct people to your retail out of, um, office space in January. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much for coming in and for taking all the questions yeah, at all the meetings and tonight. Thank, thank you all for your time. We appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. Much appreciated. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. You too. You guys said I was having issues with in the uh, spring. All right, I, I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Motion, I think, is a. It's for debate. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Motion passes. 2019-492, an ordinance amending Chapter 170 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended, requiring the posting of no trespass signs on unsafe and dangerous and or boarded property. Moved to debate. Second. Thank you, sir. Any discussion? It's a question. Uh, so if the owner is required to post the no trespassing signs, is there a um, fine or, or some other consequence associated for failure to do so? It, it would be an ordinance violation just like any other. And yes, there could be a fine. So, But so most of these, keep in mind that one of the difficulties is that Many of these properties are ones where the owner is really non-responsive. And so the uh, gist of this uh, was to try to address the, uh, if I might just take a moment, to address uh, some of the questions that Alderman Gregory had requested about Thank you. the ability of the city to post it in the event that the owner does not. But many of these uh, unsafe and dangerous and or boarded buildings are ones where the owner is simply not responsive. We'll give them a notice. We'll have an in instance where they'll go through the uh, administrative court process, even to court, still with no response. So the primary change in this, which um, you could certainly say would be quite uh, significant, would be to allow the department, meaning in this case Public Works, uh, to, uh, through the inspectors, being able to go ahead and post the property. And we looked at this very carefully because there are a lot of uh, due process issues relating to the government going on private property and being able to post a no trespass. Uh, we believe that this uh, limited uh, process in the case involving unsafe and dangerous, where there's a danger to the public, and or a boarded where there is to be no occupancy are instances where uh, the city can properly have the authority that if the owner fails to post, then the city can take the initiative and post it and uh, have the ability to then in turn enforce it against a trespasser. All in the okay, right I now. just... Go ahead, Doris. Go ahead. No, I, I, un I understand all that what you just said. I, I just think that if we're going to say that the main responsibility lies with the owner of the property, there should be some consequence if the owner doesn't do it instead of just saying that then the city can do it. Well, it would be a, a would potentially end up with a normal, I shouldn't say normal, with a, a, a typical ordinance violation uh, fine going through the process where the notice is issued, we file an ordinance violation complaint, and uh, the there are standard uh, uh, fines or penalties for a violation of any of these provisions. So it can be per day or it can be, it can be instances of maybe $100 or it can be like in uh, another example would be the, um, uh, in, in a generic way, like the uh, Walmart scenario, we have general uh, ability to ask for <laughs> fines. Okay, now, so if the, if I was simply going to say if the property owner, though, is unresponsive, we can't locate them. Uh, then the ability to collect it, of course, is minimal. To actually, you know, get the fine in hand. And Corporation Council, if uh, if it's posted and notice is given to trespassers, they could be charged with criminal trespass to land. Is that correct? Well, uh, 
what, what this contemplates is we have a uh, provision in the city code regarding uh, for property uh, violations uh, involving trespass where they can be fined. It would not be a criminal trespass, i.e. State, state law provision, but it would allow the city to uh, basically fine or direct the persons to leave and or fine them. Under the, under the provision of city code, not the state uh, I think criminal I'm law. I think I'm referring to that a lot of these buildings are ransacked and, and uh, robbed and that kind of thing. Burned down. Which puts it a criminal offense, and that's what I was asking. Yeah, and, and there could be instances where, uh, where there would be evidence of a criminal conduct, in which case police would file a police report and it would go to the state's attorney's office. Thank you. So is there any way? I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, 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 oh. No, go ahead and finish. <laughs> So, than the sensor. so is there any way that um, all of these things can be addressed in the ordinance instead of just saying could be, could happen, might happen? Is there any way that those things could be addressed in the ordinance? Because I think that I think that the ordinance is a, is a good is a good first step. However, it seems to me that the only thing it's saying is that. Public Works can put a no trespassing sign on a building, and there's and that's it. So, I, I just maybe I'm wrong and nobody else agrees with me, but it just seems right. like some of those. It just seems like those are things that should be included in the ordinance if you really want to have it have some teeth. Well, and what what is not in the ordinance? What you're not seeing is the rest of the city code because these provisions uh, are interrelated with certain of the um, uh, both housing and building codes and so on. And at the end of all of those chapters, there are specific fines related to violation of the chapters. Okay. And I'll be happy to get that for you. Okay, I'll let it go. <laughs> Thank you. I love a sign. Signs are great. Um, but if we are not going to get a landlord registration on the books in the city, which we are obviously mixed on, then we as a council have got to get serious about tightening up these ordinances. It, it takes far too long for trash to be picked up, for buildings to be bulldozed, for these absentee landlords to get away with houses being burned down, people being murdered at, two things that happened in Ward 6 at vacant properties last year. I'm done with it. We've got to, we've got to get serious about this, all 10 of us, because it, it can't continue to go on. Take a drive down, you know, we have a list of problem properties. I had a guy calling me, who calls me, I was talking about this earlier, calls me every day with pictures of his neighbors. Um, Public Works goes out and cites him. Next day, he's got more stuff in his yard. Public Works comes out, picks up all the stuff out of his yard, and he starts putting out more junk. That's, that's not the intent of, of these ordinances. We've got to get serious about this. Because I'm, I'm tired of taking the calls. I'm tired of getting these emails. This is not how this is supposed to work. And we either need more city inspectors, we either need more building inspectors, or we need ordinances with more teeth in them. Because what we're doing is not working. I totally agree, and I think that I think that we have an ordinance here that has the potential to be something that addresses some of that, and we need to add more teeth to it while we have while we have the opportunity. Let's do it. Alderman Hanna. Thank you. Yeah, it's in. in I will say this: it's, it's not just the the rental properties either. It's people that own their houses and I mean we've all had the hoarders and and whatnot and uh, you know people that have abandoned their property which is amazing to me but people abandon their houses and and uh, they go to Florida and just let let it go and uh, it, I think that we do need to, to look at a more of a progressive discipline on on these these uh, uh, fines and you know when they can when, when they can, when they get targeted or get cited, and then by the time they go to admin court, all they have to do is prove that um, they fixed the problem, and we don't we don't find them. As soon as they get cited, they should get a, a minimum of twenty five fifty dollar fine just for our staff time. And then the next time, if it's same property, 
it should be $100. And then, and then the next time, hit them with 1000 That's minimum. Because if you're not going to do that, they're not going to stop doing it. They're going to run to men court. See, I got it done. And they'll do a, a, you know, kind of a shoddy job just to get it, just to get through the court. But we've got to come up with a, with a progressive type discipline on this. That's what I think happens. You start, you know, you start doing that. And I think you're going to, you, you'll, you'll try to, you'll get, I think you'll get a lot of it cleaned up, but. I could be just wishing. So, I don't think Alderman, ever Alderman I agree. There's got to be something done because there is a problem. I got a uh, property in Timberlane uh, right now that I, if it wasn't for public works and, and zoning, uh, there I had to call Matt McLaughlin today. Just the guy, that, that, it's constant over and over and over again. Uh, I know Daryl Harris has been out to a place on the lake. And, uh, several times, and I think that's in the uh, legal side now for uh, looking at trying to take their lease away. Bottom line is, is we got to have progressive discipline. Absolutely, we can't just keep finding them twenty-five bucks. We got to. It's got to go up every time. It's got to double or triple or ten times it, because the, they don't care. And it, the landlords are the ones that should be the ultimate one that gets nailed. I mean, you can hit put it on the on the tenant for as long as you can, but eventually. We you can't get nail the land. landlords if you can't find them. Exactly. Well, I, I, I'm with you. I, we just need to refine that. We refine that. All right. And one other thing I'd like to add is we need to have some kind of a regulation on the sign. I know that's a minimal thought, but if, if somebody comes along with a little bitty sign that says no trespassing, somebody overlooks it, we need to have something that's substantial. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. We've got two representatives from inner city older neighborhoods here tonight, and I know that you've got a uh, landlord registration ordinance in draft, and I think you're looking for five co-sponsors, and I know some of us, including myself, have said a yes to that, so we just need to get five on board, and then with the mayor's help, we can get that through the council. As far as enforcement, I'd like to compliment uh, Alderman Gregory, this is a good ordinance as far as it goes. It's a step forward, and um, it does say, you know, the owner shall post a tr no trespass, and that's our city attorneys pointed out. Uh, when you fail to comply with a shell statement in our code, there's other code provisions that provides for a fine. But as far as overall enforcement, you know, this council passed an ordinance that uh, Alderman Proctor put out, um, the three strikes and you're out. Generally speaking, when there's a violation out there, um, if you cure the violation, there's no fine or penalty. But we passed an ordinance, um, I guess r roughly three years ago, that if you get cited three times, the same landlord three times, whether it be the same offense or different offenses on three different um, dates, um, there will be a fine. You can't get out of it the third time if it's over a two-year period. I believe it's a time span, Alderman uh, Proctor. So that's, that gives our Public Works Housing Division managers some teeth, and uh, we do need systems to count those three times and to get the information out there so that we don't miss the opportunity to uh, find a uh, landlord that's, that's um, on a recurring basis failing to meet our uh, housing code. So um, I agree with everything that everyone's saying here tonight, and um, we just have to keep our, our eyes on the ball and, and make sure we make progress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Alderman McMillan, can I ask a question? Uh, you had referred to a, uh, an, an effort to have a landlord registration ordinance. Is this something that's being talked about by Alderman, or? This is something that ICON has come. They're going to individual Alderman one at a time and uh, asking them to review the proposed language and see if it's acceptable and, and that kind of thing. Must be doing a numerical order then. All right, thank you. I'm just curious. Well, I, do you feel uh, slighted? Uh, I can't say that I feel slighted. It's just my point is I just haven't been contacted. Look forward to that discussion. I'm sure that you're on their list. I think everybody's I'm on sure. their list. Thank you. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Any unfinished business? Mr. Chair, just two quick things. Uh, one, if I, I'd like to uh, request to be added as a co-sponsor for uh, agenda items number 2019, 485, and 486 that pertain to Churchill Road, the bridge. 
And then the second thing, I just wanted to know uh, the status. Uh, we talked about this uh, some months ago, the status of uh, uh, the drafting an ordinance related to instances where there are shipping crates that are put on in, uh, property, on properties in, in particular, uh, like in the backyard, front yard. And I just wondered if uh, that is still on the agenda. I'd like it to yes. be. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll speak with you afterwards. Thank you very much. Alderman Hanna. I guess this is old business since we've already set the calendar, um, but uh, in December, we have a committee meeting scheduled for the 31st on New Year's Eve. Um, I, I don't care because I don't go out for New Year's Eve too often, but uh, I think that it would be nice to move it back to the 30th maybe on a Monday. Is that acceptable or do we want to... Is there any discussion in either way? I don't. Ralph, there's another idea out there um, similar to yours. It would just move the date back to the 19th, um, which would be, I think we did that last last holiday season, which they, which gave us two weeks of no meetings. So if we move the 31st committee meeting to Thursday the 19th, um, we would then have um, the week of Christmas and the week of uh, New Year's with no meetings. and. Um, we did something similar to that last year. We we had a city council meeting on a Tuesday for passage, and then two days later we had a committee meeting. So that would be uh, something we could also consider. To that note, is it doable for the clerk's office and meeting the 48-hour rule? Okay. Because we also have two meetings the week before, the 10th and 11th. So I don't know when I'm supposed to do my holiday shopping. <laughs> What are you buying? Nothing. What are you, you get nothing. You get an alley. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't deserve so, an alley. He doesn't appreciate him. Do we have a motion to change it? Well, I'm, I'm just throwing it out for discussion right now, John. I don't care. I, you know, I mean, I'm good with the 30th, but I don't know if people are traveling. I don't, you know. I'm traveling that weekend. I can't make the 19th. Any other suggestions? Do we want to just wait a week to discuss it? Do we want to consider it? this? Yeah. Hold it? Yeah. All right, we'll discuss it next week then. Are there any citizens? Are no, there no, any no, business. business? New business. I got new business. <laughs> Whoa. How do you like um, um, Director Bottom, I, my favorite phrase is, you know, construction is the price of progress, but in the case of Walnut Street, it's the price of um, trash building up and leaves that have gone uncollected and my phone ringing off the hook. Okay. Um, I know we addressed three of them today, so they can reach out to our office and then we'll coordinate either with Republic Services or Waste Management or, or Lake Area. We appreciate it. It's a huge project, I understand, and I know it needs to be completed. Um, it's just been a real struggle, especially for that block and this time of year. So I appreciate we'll your, your attention. Thank you. Thanks. Mayor? Just a reminder, uh, the city's closed on Friday, so you can actually park on the streets for free. What about Thursday? What's that? You're open Thursday? Thursday? Yeah, Thursday we're closed. <laughs> <laughs> and you can park on the street for free. That's true. <laughs> and then uh, Friday is at 5 o'clock Friday, Holiday Lighting Festival at the Gables out west. And then Saturday begins the Holiday Walks downtown uh, during the day with the tree lighting ceremony at the Old State Capitol Plaza at 5.30. I have two things. Corporation Council Alderman Proctor brought a, a proposal to you for a reconsideration vote on the uh, zoning ordinance for South 6th Street. Uh, can you tell us if, if and when we can do that? Um, I had sent uh, some information to Alderman Proctor about that. We are not allowed to do a reconsideration. That came up before, if you recall, on the Dollar General issue. 
And okay. so I had indicated that I would talk with him, and I thought he suggested talking with you to talk through what the author uh, potentials are. We're getting different information from the Municipal League, could, so we need to talk about that pretty soon, sure. okay? Uh, my second thing is, is there was supposed to be a liquor license on tonight for, uh, come on up now, for a restaurant on Toronto Road. Do you know where that might be? Go ahead and tell them where. I'm not, I'm not sure which the. Go ahead. Um, my name is Victoria Gonzalez. This is my mother, which she's the, the owner for the restaurant, Eulalia Gonzalez. And um, it's Taqueria El Dorado. And uh, we were told to come in today just in case. It was that it was already going to be in the agenda in case anyone had any questions. I thought it was on the preliminary agenda. It is. Okay. It was on the first reading last week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So will that be, when will that? I, I'm, I will just need to check on it because I don't recall if it was on the first reading the last week. Uh -huh. uh, if this is a committee meeting, so if it is, we can address it at the council meeting. Thank you. That's all. Uh, they they came up here, they that. didn't, they, they weren't sure, so that's, that's why they're here. So we just want to make sure we get that certainly sure. form. Which yeah. is when it would have been voted on anyway. Correct. So, yeah. okay. that, that is correct. Yes. Okay, Thank I'll keep you. my eye on it for you. Thank you so much. All right, good luck. Okay. Thank you. I have just two things, um, Mayor. If I can, if I can check on to yours. Um, Saturday is small business um, Saturday, shopping small business. I have got some fabulous businesses in Ward Eight. I'd love to see you come out west on Monroe, um, but also downtown for the, for the holiday walks. Uh, very exciting time. And then also, if I could, um, Chief, I'd just like to congratulate your recent uh, you get fire, um, fire promotions, firefighter promotions. I wasn't able to make it to that, but um, please pass on our, our hearty congratulations to everyone who, who received promotions this week. So thank you for that. I got one more announcement, sorry. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Chuck. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, the Utilities Committee meeting is going to be held on December 11th. Uh, at 5.30 p.m. For all your, for your all information for the press and for the public, thank you. Are there, is that the end of new business? No, nobody else. Citizens to address the committee. Mary Francis. That's just my other question. Uh, Mary Francis, 101 West Kennedy. Mayor Langfelder, at the November 5th council meeting, you stated the following, and I'm quoting, Nate Bottom, we'll have him go out this upcoming week or this week and see how they can secure the area and take whatever it needs to do that. Then that will give us a bearing of what we need to do for next budget year. He can calculate what all has been spent up to this point and then what needs to be done to secure it, because we don't want to go the winter having it unsecured waiting for the next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So that will give us a bearing on how much would be needed. Again, I think everybody pointed it out. We need to start getting to the remediation, especially the building that burnt. Bring it down and start chipping away at it, and how best can we do that? And so we need to rely on federal and state resources whenever possible to make that happen, end quote. Did Nate Bottom inspect it? This is the Pillsbury Mills plant. Did Nate Bottom calculate what has been spent so far? Did Nate Bottom create a plan for securing it? Has council talked to federal and state agencies about how the city can remediate? If the city acquires the property, will the liens be forgiven? I'm part of Moving Pillsbury Forward, a new volunteer group asking questions like these. I want answers and action from the city. I know en enough now to tell you that state, federal, and private stakeholders will not get involved in helping us unless the city takes responsibility for this property. I'm not talking about just securing it, I'm talking about acquiring it. If you look at our website, you'll see support from many organizations. We had a community meeting in the neighborhood where over 50 residents attended. There was also support from concerned citizens around the city as well as state and federal elected officials. I've gathered statistical and anecdotal data to indicate people in that area are suffering disproportionately from negative health effects. This is more than a budget issue. This is a human rights issue, not only for Springfield, but um, for beyond. Mayor Langfelder, we did a survey at the community meeting. It was almost a tie between putting a grocery store or a green space there. That's what the people want, and you're elected to serve all the people of Springfield. Your MPOs, police officers, police chief, 
firemen, fire chief, hired staff, and elected city officials who ignore this issue reflect poorly on you as a leader. It states on a U.S. EPA website, this is a direct quote, Illinois EPA and the city of Springfield continue to monitor the site for improper activities and are trying to compel the owner to provide better security, end of quote. The Illinois EPA and the city are not monitoring the site, and the owner is doing nothing. When are you going to take control and make this a win-win for yourself and the whole city? And I'm asking you to do six things. The first one is to create a Pillsbury Advisory Council that meets monthly and posts agendas and minutes on the city website. Two is to put Pillsbury on the next agenda for the Urban Forestry Commission and make it a top priority for beautification through Springfield Green. And three is to ask the police chief to require NPO weekly surveys of the Pillsbury property with results given to the proper authorities. Four is to put $20,000 in the next budget to secure the property. Five is to join us for a perimeter property walk at the Pillsbury plant. It's on Saturday, December 7th from 12 to 1, and it's, we're meeting at the main gate on the corner of 15th and East Phillips. And finally, I'm asking you to go to our supporters page of our website and to sign up and give us support so we can list your name on the website. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, they can uh, talk about the progression of the others, but I'll answer the ones I can. Uh, with regards to uh, the police chief, I think it was the fire chief or fire representatives went out to the site with public works, and I'm not sure who else went out there. I think it's at about that point in time that you're talking about. With regards to the breaches, I think there's eight of them. Um, that information was uh, sent to the Illinois Attorney General's office. And so uh, really we're trying to determine what we're able to do from a legal standpoint with regards to uh, patching those or what can be done uh, with regards to that. The other item was the perimeter fencing. I believe uh, Nate's putting it out for a bid and uh, whether we can, you know, uh, my preference would be if we can, put it around the perimeter and then just where the buildings are, not necessarily the silos. Uh, but again, that comes down to what we're able to do and of course the costs associated with it. Really the end game is uh, declaring this site a super fun site, which we've talked about. The reason for that is you can go back on the previous owners possibly. Um, I think the US EPA is, uh, I think it was October 30th or near the end of October, they had said that they're looking at uh, potential other super fun sites to list. Uh, I did send a, uh, request into them to take a look at that, and they're setting up a conference call with regards to those discussions. So really, uh, I think uh, we're also looking at the amount it would take to demo. Uh, I just went online to look at what the estimate would be. I think it's 750,000 square feet, and that puts it probably uh, north of $10 million. So that's the other piece of it, uh, because <coughs> just like anything, Right now it's in play. If we want to take that on as a council, you're taking on the entire liability of that. And so that's where the federal dollars come in and really have to be cautious with regards to that. But we will have uh, uh, dollars associated with uh, within the budget um, on what we can do with securing the site. So I don't know if Nate Bottom wants to come up or Corporation Council, if you want to add anything Just to Just very that. briefly, the officers do now monitor it daily. And in fact, uh, the city is working actually with the Attorney General's office as recently as um, actually today with the officer participating in signing affidavits that have to go back to court. Uh, so there is a regular process in place um, and that will become better over time. But I know that the uh, uh, MPOs involved or the officers involved, I believe, are actually doing daily reviews and that information is then uh, being submitted to the Attorney General's office who currently has the cases pending regarding the uh, enforcement issues. So the other thing, community involvement, uh, especially with the Superfund site, uh, that's a part of that whole process. So uh, that'd be welcome with regards to that. Alder, Alderman Hanau. Thank you. You know, I, I agree that something needs to be done with it, but I cannot, I think it'd be very irresponsible for any of us up on this horseshoe to purchase that property because it is 
we don't know what we're getting into. Mm -hmm. And it could be tens of millions of dollars in cleanup fees that we don't know, you know, just like uh, the, the coal tar situation when we bought a, bought a piece of land and we got stuck with the, with the cleanup that was very expensive. We could have the same situation here. The cost of demo, that puts all the cost on us. And I'm sorry, but I, I cannot, I cannot, I just think it's very irresponsible if we even think about uh, taking over or purchasing that property. Um, it really needs to go back to the Pillsbury and the Cargill. It, it, they're the ones that, that kind of abandon it, and uh, they're the ones that should be cleaning it up. But the city of Springfield should not be buying that for the simple fact that we will end up with you know, fifty, a hundred million dollars potentially. I don't know. I, I don't know what's out there. The, with how much more asbestos? How much? You know, when you start getting into things, and those silos are going to be—they're not a regular building that you're going to knock down. Those silos are meant to take blast. Right. So, um, that's that's my take. And what you do with those? Uh, you know, you might even leave them in place. Who knows? But that's something we work with the U.S. EPA on, uh, the Attorney General, and others. But. Public Works, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Nope. Well, first of all, we've uh, frequented that site on several occasions, not just at, at the time in which you requested it, but it's done on a weekly basis. Uh, the pickups and stuff for that site has been ongoing as well, so we get things like fly dumping that is done a lot of times. The Alderman uh, uh, Turner will call about those particular things, but our also our inspector is going out to the site at least two to three times a week to make sure that we keep that area clean. As far as the interior of that site, EPA has given strict restrictions of enforcement about who can go on that site, and it's normally it's accompanied with an EPA official as far as past the gate. So we actually have to have a key just to open into the interior of the gate on that site as far as uh, areas, uh, that I think the mayor already addressed it. We've looked at the areas that can be breached. But also, you have another issue with the railroad associations, too, as well, because a certain portion in the back rear of that site is actually owned by the railroad. So you got several ownerships that you're dealing with regarding that particular parcel of property. Uh, I tend to agree with the mayor on this. This is this is an issue that has to be dealt with for enforcement through the attorney general's office, uh, and then we need to look at the super fund. Uh, this is not something the city of Springfield can take on. Like Alderman Hanauer said, uh, I think the city council is uh, is on board to try to come up with the money to secure that area with a fencing. And I know the mayor's in the, and you guys are in the process of that, but there's no way I'll vote for a purchase of of. of uh, and we're also working on, as the mayor's statement, as um, looking at a demolition cost of the right. site, but we are hovering definitely over 10 million. Easy. Alderman Hanauer, it, it's already been, um, the legal counsel has already stated at a council meeting that um, Cargill and Pillsbury are no longer legally liable for this site, so it's impossible to go back um, to them. I, I, I will just say I, I will not be voting to, I will be a no vote to take Okay, over. that's fine, I but can't. I just hate to see that kind of misinformation continually being put out there because it's impossible to do what you're saying. But with the super fund, yep. can't they go right. back on them, right? And, and is that no. correct? Yeah, if you just let me, it, please. what I had indicated the last time was that the both the Attorney General's office and uh, Illinois EPA indicated to me that uh, and I had a very lengthy call with them probably, it's been at the request of the mayor probably three weeks ago, three and a half, four weeks ago. And uh, the issue came up about the status of the litigation, also their uh, review of the applicable law to try to go back. Um, their position at that time was that they had looked at it very carefully. They did not think there was a case to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and we are asking the US EPA to uh, basically readdress that. We have talked to their regional council in Chicago, uh, who's arranging for the mayor to talk to some of the uh, uh, higher uh, uh, persons involved in some of these specific uh, programs. So whether or not they will cons uh, uh, continue that view, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. 
Uh, I do just uh, by way of a um, liability uh, comment, uh, I do think that uh, uh, Alderman Hanauer, Alderman Redpath, the mayor are exactly correct that the city would want to exercise extreme caution mm -hmm. to acquire the property uh, if it were allowed to be just even donated, which I think they would donate mm -hmm. it in a pretty quick second just to get it off their books. And what that would end up doing is putting potentially the city as a legal, legally responsible party for the cleanup. And that would be the uh, most uh, uh, inappropriate thing to do. Uh, the best course of action now is for the city and others to work with US EPA uh, to identify funds that they might have available because both, both the state attorney general's office and Illinois EPA have indicated they have no money. Okay, but do they, you know? They also have indicated they expect US EPA to eventually identify funds to try to do something with the property. Okay, do you know if the liens would be forgiven if the city purchased it? Well, the uh, two million. You're talking about the liens from mm -hmm. US EPA. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect that the US EPA would be uh, happy to forgive those if mm -hmm. they got a responsible party to take on the rest of the cost. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, I just don't think it would be a good business deal because the cost would be far in excess of the two million that of the liens that they put on okay. there. Mm -hmm. The US EPA does not expect to recover those funds. Okay, I just want to say one more thing about monitoring. Um, I'm, I'm happy that housing and the police department are monitoring it, but we have to have this documented. Absolutely. We have to have a paper trail. It has to go up the chain of command to the attorney general's office whenever you see a breach. And it's, it's, according to what I, the research I've done, this has not been documented. Yeah, we'll uh, take a look at that, make sure it gets done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Are there, uh, do we have an executive session? Are there any other citizens to address the committee? Carol? I'm Carol Needler. I live at 2016 South 4th Street, and I want to thank Alder Alderwoman DeCenso for bringing up the problem property issue, and, and I'll try to be brief. Um, you know, certainly ICON has been working on uh, property registration. Um, we kind of started there because we feel that landlords have the, the wherewithal to do something different with the property, and like a, a prop, someone who, who lives in a property, we don't want to make people homeless. We are sensitive to people who may not be able to make um, improvements to their property. We've suggested to the mayor, and he has suggested back to us some programs to address those issues. But in addition to that, I want to agree with Alderman Hainauer that um, we have, ICON also has an, a more extensive program beyond just property registration that involves holding people accountable, higher fines, stricter ordinances. You know, rental registration is not the answer. We need a budget that allows for more inspectors. We need a budget that allows for more attorneys to prosecute those cases. And people should be fined when they have to take up city resources. They should have to pay for that. And especially the people who take up city resources over and over and over again. You know who they are. We know who they are. Those people need to be held accountable. And we have not managed to get to everyone. We are happy to talk to everyone. And that includes you, Alderman Donlin. Um, we, you know, there's no slight intended. We're working on this ordinance. We have gone back to the drawing board several times based on input from the people we've talked to so far. And, you know, we are happy to continue considering ways to make it better and other ideas for addressing problem properties in Springfield. We really do need to get that fixed, and um, we're, we're, we're open to, to any ideas that you may have. So thank you very much for um, talking about that tonight. Thank you. Alice? I'm Alice Ramey, and I'm a displaced homeowner right now, okay? 
<laughs> I thought I'd just throw that out. All right. Um, I understand about abandoned houses. When I was on the Springfield uh, board at one time with when uh, the late mayor, okay, we had made an ordinance that if they did not, even if they cleaned up their property and come in front of the person here, they got fined anyway. We have to do something more destructive. And I know there's several houses in on Livingston that needs to be addressed. And I have not called you yet, I'm sorry, but I've been busy with attorneys and insurance people and inspectors. But uh, I think it's time that we got it together and make them accountable. And I know the people that live there in Renton has a hard time even mowing their grass, so you have that $60 that you have to put on them for not mowing the grass. And that's a problem, okay? But we need that taken care of. Thanks for bringing that up. I also think it's time that we make the first one, corporate counsel, $500 a fine for the first time, 2000 the second time, and 5000 in their house given back to uh, the city, and they pay their loan. That's the way it should be, that's the way it should be, to make me accountable. There was a house on 13th and Jackson that all of us at the Springfield Project stood in front of with signs, okay? Big signs, not little signs that you can't read, great big ones, and we got our job done. But it took two hours in the rain soaking wet to do it. We need to get it done because this is Springfield. We want our city to be able to come, people come in and say, well, wow, what are they doing to keep their houses all done up? And what are they doing to do, make this done? Well, for the other thing is Pillsbury, okay? I used to play at Pillsbury, run up and down the ropes and get donuts, okay? And my mother worked there, my father worked there, and practically half my family did. I think it's time that we look at the situation. Don't buy it. Don't even think about buying it, okay? Make the silos something else. I know uh, for a fact that it's gonna be a mess. And it's gonna take more than $10 million to blow it up, okay? Because there's a lot of things that has to be done. This man tells me there's not nothing wrong with the land. Well, I can almost grant to tell you, you'll have to take 25 feet of that land off because of everything that's been on it. And the asbestos is sitting out there on the ground, soaking it up, okay? People don't need to live in that entire environment, none. Those poor kids that walk up and down to go to school, they breathe that stuff. That's not proper for them either. And besides the vaping going on besides. But Mayor, don't buy it get it to the super for we can get it done and send it back to Cardell's who needs it, okay? That needs to come out there and clean it up himself for leaving it the way it was. And I wanna wish y'all a happy Thanksgiving. And there's another thing, I wanted to compliment the police department and the fire department. <laughs> All right, chiefs, chiefs, okay, because they keep watching my house, which is, I got a no trespassing sign. I also signed a no trespassing law where if somebody comes on my land that's not supposed to be there, they're gone, okay? Absolutely gone. <laughs> and uh, I want my house, I don't want it tore up or burned down again because I haven't got fixed the first time. So it'll probably be worse the second time. But I wanna wish you all very much and a blessed one and a happy one and all your, Blessings be answered in the way it should be. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Chris. Sure. I'm Chris Richmond. I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with me. I'm at 641 West Woodland Avenue. I'm a community volunteer. I'd like to explain to you a little bit about what 
moving Pillsbury forward is all about. I've been asked this question dozens of times the last two months since I started working on this project. So who are we? We're a group of community volunteers focusing on understanding the challenge and issues related to the Pillsbury property. And this goes back uh, 19 years now when the plant was mothballed in 2001 by Cargill. Uh, there's a long history. Uh, I've provided that for you. Uh, so you've got that in front of you. Glad to answer any questions you may have. I've got a robust understanding of the property and the history. My father worked there from 1970 to 1991. I've got a personal stake in this. That's the, uh, that's the job that put my brother and I through college. So it is important to me, and it is important to me that we come together as a community to solve this. What I've done over the past couple of months is bring together a grassroots effort, a bottom-up effort of multiple organizations. I reached out to seven local community organizations that have a stake in this, and I've talked to all of them. Last week, we hosted a program at, at Landfair High School where we had more than 50 residents from within a half mile radius of Pillsbury come to hear what we had to say and to discourse back and forth with us. Question and answer session about some of the things that have been put out there about this. And there are plenty of items to discuss. I believe there's quite a bit of misinformation out there and it's unfortunate that perhaps some in the horseshoe have, have heard that misinformation and bought into it. What I'm suggesting is that the very first step that needs to take place beyond what we've already done in a ground up start with talking to the community is to all get together, those of you around the horseshoe, representatives from the city, other community groups. This is a large problem that needs active problem solving by multiple segments of our community, but here's what we know. It's been a multi-year problem 19-year problem. It has a community carrying cost now. That's being documented in health effects. And as our public works uh, deputy director here said, and as, as we know about our police department, they're doing daily checks on this for the unknown future. How many years is that going to go on? And we do know that we need to work with the US EPA and others our partners up the political food chain, our state representatives, our congressional delegation, for which we've reached out to all of them at this point already. So it would be nice if we all came together in one space to air it out, to work together toward this large community problem. Now it has been suggested, and I have a minute and a half left, that. Yes, the first step is for us all to come together with good information in the public sphere. I'm proud that it started at the grassroots level with the people who live there because now we know what they want. Now we just need to get busy about getting it done. So what does that look like? That does look like us all coming together with good information, working together, setting some short-term goals and long-term goals. Short-term goal, obviously everybody agrees that making the place, rendering the place safe is the first big step. Now we are suggesting through fairly extensive research that the next likely step is to develop a really good plan for what we're going to do when we as a community take possession of that, whether that looks like the city of Springfield or whether that looks like a non-for-profit organization. But what we know is private owners are not going to take care of that. So there's your two choices. One choice is much easier than the others. It's likely it's the public choice because that allows you to very quickly cut through the tax situation, the lien situations, and allow for grant funding. So that's where we're at at this point. I recommend that everybody go to the website, get the good information that we've got on there, and begin working together with us and all the other stakeholders. I appreciate your time. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, Chris, has anybody gotten a, a, an estimate or a realization of what it was going to cost to clean up the proce process, the project? Right. We've consulted with the brownfield specialists, professional in this, as well as civil engineers. And the, ant the short answer is an environmental phase one and an environmental phase two needs to be conducted on that property before you can get a cost estimate for the demolition. That said, 99 plus percent of all of the hazardous material contamination on that site was cleaned up in 2017. I oversaw that locally. I know that. It's on the public record on the website. And if you read the detail, of that website, you'll know that 220 tons of material were removed and that was approximately 99% of the problem. Keep in mind, this was a food grade facility. It's very unlikely that there's extensive ground contamination similar to what we dealt with 40 years ago, 30 years ago with the Park South Fiat Alice property. So the cleanup is not likely as much as you might think. You're not going to know that until someone funds a phase one and a phase two environmental so that we can know what we're talking about. I will say the demo actually bringing the buildings down into a pile of rubble is quite likely to cost less than $10 million. If you were to cart off all the material, that would cost an extreme amount of money. It's highly unlikely that would ever happen. It doesn't happen on any of these sort of sites. Doesn't matter where you look. It comes down and it gets pulverized. And it likely gets either used for road fill, other infrastructure in our community, or it gets leveled on site, capped over, and then reused. After that, the site gets reused for whatever is available. Uh, so my short answer is, Quite likely the price tag on this entire project is less than $10 million. We don't absolutely know that until we do that in environmental phase one and phase two. This is doable and it is doable within five years. We all need to get in the same room and start talking. The uh, original price tag from what I understand was about $20 million and that was 15 to 20 years ago. And the, the price that I've heard from people that are in the construction business would have cost upwards of 30 to 40 million dollars and they'd have to haul the, the uh, silos, the ground up silos, up to Peoria. And the, if you want to use it for any kind of a yeah. business or use the land or do anything, you'd have to haul that stuff away. Negative. I mean, that's, that's simply conjecture. Um, I, I when guess you, we're you both have conjecture. When you consult with the brownfield specialist, you hear different answers. Um, the 200 plus tons of material that were removed were removed to the Taylorville, the Christian County landfill, much closer when, when those materials had to be removed. And again, it's highly unlikely that uh, bulk materials will be removed from this site. Okay. Are there any other questions? Mr. Well, Chair, Mr. Council, they'd probably, the, if they formed a nonprofit, they'd probably give it to them, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. So there's your answer. You guys can go ahead and start a group and start that's, raising money. That's certainly been within the realm of discussion. Uh, again, I believe all, all stakeholders need to be a part of that discussion. Chris, thanks for your uh, commitment and expertise on this uh, topic, and uh, thanks for coming to the Inner City Older Neighborhoods annual meeting a week ago last night and um, making a really strong slide and video presentation with lots of uh, history and uh, promise for the future. Yeah. Appreciate your comments, thank you. Are there any other questions? Motion to adjourn. Do we have an executive session? No, sir. Second to adjourn. Second. 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 All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you. No, 
already shutting down, so they can come up tomorrow and lose things. I think.